In August of this year, I began a new spiritual practice. I simply lie down in my backyard on a beach blanket, head cushioned with an outdoor pillow. That's it. My focus is on whatever is happening in the yard at that time. It's sort of a who are the people in your neighborhood kind of situation. I notice where the sun is in the sky or whether it's hidden by clouds. I pay attention to the way the light filters through the trees. I see which critters are visiting the yard that day. And I listen. I hear the noise of insects and birds. Sometimes I hear the children playing in the schoolyard a quarter mile away. For the first couple of days of this practice, I heard screeching, chittering, barking sound. It took me a few minutes to locate its source, a squirrel in the big oak tree above my head. And of course, I have no idea what they were actually saying, but it felt like they were telling me that this was their space, or at least they were asking me what I was doing here. And I had to ask myself, is this a place for me? Which I have learned is an important question for middle-aged white women to ask ourselves way more often than we do. But by the third day, the squirrel had stopped yelling and appeared to have accepted my presence. And so every day that it was not raining, I have spent at least 20 minutes lying in my backyard. I have discovered the best place to lay my blanket so there are the fewest roots pushed into my back. I have come to love the smell of the clover that makes up a good portion of my yard, especially in the shade under the trees. I've become familiar with the different types of moss on the, on the, uh, on the trunks of the trees. Both blue jays and cardinals visit my yard, but never at the same time. And I've noticed that the first day I felt the need to wear a sweater outdoors, the insects had gotten much quieter. I also noticed that after a few minutes on the blanket, my heartbeat slowed, my breathing deepened, and my muscles relaxed. Now, I have done mindfulness exercises indoors before with some of the same results, but I usually had to focus on my breath and engage in conscious relaxation. But just being outside and paying attention to my surroundings has brought those, and those benefits with ease, dare I say, with grace. I have long had an affinity for the more than human aspects of the natural world. I've paid attention to the phases of the moon and the cycles of the seasons. I've grown a garden and reaped its harvests. But this is the first time that I have intentionally cultivated a relationship with the land on which my family lives with no expectation of return. And yet the land and all the other living things that dwell there have given me freely. They've contributed to my health and well being just by their presence, just by us being there together. And like all relationships, it has changed me. I find myself noticing the beauty of life everywhere I go. This morning's drive was full of newly turned leaves. 
that I was reminded of when I heard our choir sing Alleluia when we opened the service this morning. I have noticed the grass pushing up between the sections of the sidewalk. I've noticed the variegated leaves on the plants in my doctor's office. I find myself stopping to look at flowers in the detail that can only be appreciated when you really take the time to look closely. And I found myself feeling deeply disheartened to see land being cleared for new construction when there are empty storefronts everywhere. And I was not expected to be moved as I was by Jonathan's message this morning. When I shared my experiences with a friend, they told me about a Japanese practice known as forest bathing. Uh, there is a Japanese word for it, and out of respect for Yasuyo and any others here who speak Japanese, I'm not going to try. When I googled it, I landed on a National Geographic site and learned that the practice had developed mostly in the 1980s with a twofold purpose. To offer an antidote to tech boom burnout and to inspire residents to reconnect with and protect the country's forests. The article then went on to promote five very exotic, very expensive tours where a guide would be there to facilitate your forest bathing experience. The only thing protecting me from sinking into cynicism was my practice. I don't know whether forest bathing became commodified in Japan. What I do know is that the history of settler colonialism here in the United States has been one of two things. The governments established by European settlers either set aside wilderness for the appreciation of other Europeans, or they took and used the land, monetized it, capitalized on it, extracting from it anything that the European markets and eventually the North American markets found valuable without consideration for the human and more than human beings and biomes already inhabiting it. We are now living in the legacy of those early colonizers. We are all aware of the effects of climate change that have resulted from the continued use of fossil fuels, pollution of the air and water and land, ever expanding urban sprawl, loss of animal habitat and biodiversity, a global pandemic, refugees from land that can no longer be cultivated and the resulting conflicts, intensified storms and wildfires, melting glaciers. And we are still treating the First Nations of this continent as less than citizens of European descent. Economist David Corton suggests that for far too long, we have been telling ourselves the sacred money and markets story, rather than the sacred life and living earth story. He points out that until we interrupt the narrative that market forces are the only way to affect change, we will continue to allow corporate interests rather than the health of the planet and all its inhabitants to guide policy. We are currently caught in an age of what Corton calls eco-piety or consumo-piety, where each of us is called to choose small green actions or purchase green products in an effort to slow the effects of climate change. And while valuable, Eco-policy on a governmental level is a much more effective strategy. 
The seventh principle of Unitarian Universalism states that we affirm and promote respect for the interconnected web of all existence of which we are a part. Not the center, not the most important part, simply a part. As you use, we organize ourselves around the concept of, wait for it, covenant. <laughs> a covenant is a sacred agreement of how we intend to be in relationship. Covenantal relationships are accountable, mutual, reciprocal, respectful, and ultimately loving. What does it mean then to be in covenant with the life that is all around us and with the earth itself? Beginning as individuals, we can become aware of and develop a relationship with the land and natural communities that surround us. We can invest in the thriving and flourishing of all life in our area, both human and more than human. We can allow ourselves to fall in love with nature so that we recognize its inherent preciousness and feel the lure to protect and nourish it. We can remind ourselves and celebrate that we are a part of this diverse interconnected web. And acting as individuals will never be enough. We need to change the story. The sacred life and living earth story is one we must tell over and over again. And from this new narrative, we then act as a community on the policy level. As a congregation, North Shore has already taken action to green your collective purchasing power and policies. You have worked for climate legislation on the local, state, and national levels. Consideration has been given to the climate effects of your investments. If you, as an individual, have not been part of these activities, look for them. Ask those, let's stop. If you are a member of the Green Team or the Green Sanctuary Team, would you raise your hand? These are the folks who can tell you where these opportunities lie to work together as a community. Is there still a green newsletter? Sign up for the green newsletter to find out <laughs> when new things are coming up, to be a part of making the change on the policy level. How much easier will all this work be when everyone understands the story that we are trying to protect and heal our beloved family. For most of us, the sacred money and market story actually feels more natural, more true, because it's the one that we have heard in our society for the majority of our lives. Even within a religious context, we rarely challenge the prevailing economic wisdom. However, Indigenous peoples the world over have been telling the sacred life and living earth story for generations. Perhaps those of us who are not Indigenous should take a back seat, listen, and follow their leadership. Land and environmental defenders are ordinary people, mostly of indigenous descent, who peacefully but tirelessly campaign against external dangers to the ecosystems on which they depend. These are often corporate threats and sometimes even illegal operations. 
The diverse global defender movement is united by deep roots in their local communities and a collective struggle against further corrupt exploitation of natural resources, which endangers not just their livelihoods, but the earth as a whole. Many of us will be familiar with the work of the water protectors at Standing Rock who fought against further expansion of oil pipelines. Land defenders call for shifting power away from corporate interests and amplifying the voices of those who work for climate justice. They put pressure on governments and corporations to address their ecological malpractice. And they advocate for regulations that protect land rights, thereby protecting us all. Vine Deloria was a member of the Standing Rock Sioux. Writing in 1973, he predicted the eventual end of European expansion in the world, some future point at which it is no longer in the economic interest of Western powers to continue to extract and pollute. He concludes, who will find peace with the lands? The future of humankind lies waiting for those who will come to understand their lives and take up their responsibilities with all living things. Who will listen to the trees, the animals and birds, the voices of the places of the land? As the long forgotten peoples of the respective continents rise and begin to reclaim their ancient heritage, they will discover the meaning of the lands of their ancestors. That is when the invaders of the North American continent will finally discover that for this land, God is red. Among Earth-centered traditions, there is a common understanding. As above, so below. When we honor and respect ourselves, our fellow humans, and the world around us, we are connecting to the larger sacred spirit of life, the holy, the divine, restoring life and our planet, working to protect and heal our land and each other is spiritual and religious work. Let us then develop a wild love for the world and strive to live into it. Amen and blessed be.